Well, welcome everyone. Welcome to MPA 540 Public Personnel Management. My name is Dr. Powell and I'll be your instructor for the course. Thought I'd put together a very quick, quick combination welcome video and week one video just so I can introduce myself to you for those of you who don't know me already and then get into a little bit of our information that we will be covering in week one primarily covering chapters one and two in your textbook and the scientific management article from your classics text that I'm sure you have probably already read in your 510 course. So let me go ahead and just give you a brief introduction about who I am and where I came from. I know and look at the roster, a lot of us have worked together before. So for those of you who've had me before in class, welcome back. I look forward to working with you again. For all of you who are new to having me as an instructor, welcome. It's nice to meet you virtually. And I'll look forward to reviewing your introduction when you do your multimedia introductory presentation in our first discussion board assignment. But let me just give you a real brief introduction to me. Uh, I'm originally from Cleveland, Ohio, and there are some uh, nice pictures of beautiful, lovely Cleveland, Ohio on your screen there. I grew up in Cleveland, a working class suburb of Cleveland called Parma. I had my first job in a steel mill. Uh, since I grew up in Cleveland, I am an avid Cleveland Browns fan and Cleveland Indians fan and Cleveland Cavs fan and pretty much any Cleveland sports team I am a fan of, which has led to a lot of bitter disappointment over the years, but uh, still hanging in there as a Cleveland sports fan. I got my undergraduate degrees in political science and history from a small liberal arts college called Baldwin Wallace University. Uh, I'm so old that when I went there, it was called Baldwin Wallace College and has then changed its name a few years ago to Baldwin Wallace University. Uh, it's in a little suburb about 20 minutes south of Cleveland. And again, got my undergraduate degrees in political science and in history. Then for my master's degree, I moved on to Ohio State University and then finished up my master's degree in political science at Ohio University, which is that nice brick lined uh, picture on the right top right of the screen, uh, Ohio University located in Southeast Ohio. Uh, my daughter has just last year graduated from Ohio University and my oldest son is finishing up his sophomore year at Ohio University. And so we have a good family tradition there. My wife also went to Ohio University as well. Then I got my doctoral degree in political science at Miami University, which is the picture at the bottom of the screen. Uh, as you can tell from the Ohio University, the Miami University pictures, I kind of have a thing for ivy covered uh, brick buildings. And so got a lot of that at both of those schools. Uh, once I got my doctoral degree done in political science at Miami, a couple months later, I started my first full time teaching job at a place called Eastern Illinois University in Charleston, Illinois, which is in central Illinois amidst, amidst the uh, cornfields. And pretty much that's about it that's in central Illinois. Uh, the picture you see on your screen is what they used to call, or I guess they still do, call Old Main. It's the primary administrative building on campus. So I taught the political science department at Eastern Illinois from 1996 to 2000, teaching primarily public administration, public personnel management, public budgeting, uh, taught some Congress, some presidency, intro to American government, taught some state and local governments, model Illinois government. So taught quite a few courses in both the undergraduate as well as the graduate program there in the political science department. Then in 2000, I had the opportunity to move on to a university in Florida called Florida Gulf Coast University. Uh, interesting school. It was actually built in a swamp in Southwest Florida in Fort Myers. Uh, the state was given several hundred acres of land by a very wealthy family in Florida for the purpose of building a state university in Southwest Florida. State of Florida took the land, entered into the agreement and accepted the land sight unseen. Once they actually went and looked at the land, they found out that it basically was comprised of a swamp. And so they then had the daunting task of building a university in a pre-existing swamp. And what you see on your screen is kind of the result of that. I went there in 2000, taught there for a year, 
developing the MPA program as well as co-founding an undergraduate program in political science that is still at the university and is still going strong today. When I got to Florida Gulf Coast in 2000, the university was only three years old. So a lot of those buildings you see on your screen, they weren't there when I was there. When I first got there, like I said, the university was three years old. I think we had a total of about eight or nine buildings on campus. And we actually had a resident alligator that lived in the pond outside of the public administration building, uh, lovingly called Big Al. And uh, I don't know if Big Al is still there after all these years, but the university certainly has grown by leaps and bounds. I think when I got to the university, we had about 1,500 or 2,000 students. I think today the enrollment is upwards of about 20,000, and it's a very growing and vibrant university in the, uh, the state system down there in Florida. In 2001, I came out here to California and relocated, brought the family out, and accepted the position at California State University, Long Beach. And I've been a full-time faculty member there ever since. So this year, I'm finishing up my 18th year on faculty in what we call the Graduate Center for Public Policy and Administration. I am in my second term as the department chair and the director of the on-campus program. And I am in my, I hate to say this because it really makes me sound old, but I'm in my 15th year as the director of the distance learning MPA program. So I've been teaching there full time for quite a while, and now I am teaching as a contributing faculty member now at um, California Baptist, and very happy to be here. And this is my third course that I'm teaching at Cal Baptist. But when you put up my entire career together over the past, I guess, 22, 23 years, I've taught just about every single course you can think of in the field of public administration and public policy including obviously this public personnel management course that we'll be taking together uh, as, a, as a class now. I've uh, taught that in the past, taught that in Eastern Illinois, taught at Florida Gulf Coast, and, and now teaching it again here at Cal Baptist. Um, I currently live in Santa Clarita uh, with my wife and four kids. Again, one of my kids is off in Ohio at Ohio University. And I have another kid who's going to be heading off to San Diego State in the fall. Uh, my oldest, my daughter, as I said, has already graduated from Ohio University. And my youngest is 12. And so he says now that he'll be going off to Ohio University in a few years. But we will wait and see if that happens. Uh, in addition to my teaching and the research that I do at Cal State Long Beach, I'm also a local elected official. Uh, I serve on as a trustee on the governing board of the Saugus Union School District up here in Santa Clarita. I was appointed to that position in 2014 and reelected in 2016. My current term ends in um, December of 2020. We are an elementary school district. We serve about 10,000 students. We have 15 school sites and we have a budget operating budget about 110, 115 million dollars annually. So it's been an interesting experience working in the school district. So that's a little bit about me and who I am and where I'm from and some of the experiences that I bring into the classroom. So I thought it was just useful for you to kind of learn a little bit about me and then obviously since this is a video be able to put a face with the name and I do look forward to working with everyone. Uh, let me go ahead and just briefly jump out of here and then jump into our class. And let me just zoom that. Give me one second to jump into the classroom. And okay. Okay, let's just talk a little bit about what the course is and what we are going to be doing this semester and just kind of, you know, give you a little bit of a sense of, of what types of things we're going to be studying and, and how we're going to be doing it. So let me go ahead and... Let's 
see, here we go. Hopefully you're able to see that. I think you are. Um, but I just opened up the classroom for you and to kind of show you week one and some of the things that we are gonna be covering in week one. Um, the whole purpose of this class obviously is to familiarize you with human resource management. And now I know the title of the course is Public Personnel Management, but what we're gonna be doing in the class is much more akin to human resource management, where we are really gonna start looking at the role that individuals play within organizations and then how we, from an organizational perspective, recruit, uh, train people, evaluate performance of employees, discipline and sanction when necessary, interface with collective bargaining agreements and public sector unions, interface with legal requirements, equal employment opportunity requirements, affirmative action requirements, um, anti-discrimination in terms of age and pregnancy and all those types of laws that we deal with in the public sector and government agencies and kind of show you what all of those limitations are, how to operate within those limitations to hopefully create the most effective and most efficient workforce that you can within your organization. So really before we necessarily talk a lot about week one, let me just go into the syllabus real quickly and I'm not gonna spend a lot of time on it because I know you've probably already taken a look at the syllabus, but let's just take a look at some of the important elements from it. The course description, I think you're probably familiar with that. We don't have to spend time going through it. You have taken these online MPA courses before, so you're familiar with how the courses work, kind of the flow of the courses over the eight weeks, so I don't think we have to belabor that too much. Uh, my contact information is located in the syllabus. Uh, my phone number is there, my email address is there. One caution I will give to you is that I am good with email, but I am notoriously bad with voicemail. So I strongly recommend that if you need to contact me, contact me either through email or through the Q&A section on the course website. Those are the best ways to contact me. I check in on my email every single day. I will usually be checking into the course website every day as well, if not two or three times a day. So electronically is usually the best way to contact me. So email, as opposed to voicemail if you want a quick response. The books we're gonna be using in the course, you're already familiar with this, but the Bowman West and Van Wart book, the one that's listed in the syllabus is the fifth edition. There is a sixth edition that was just recently published. I am okay with you using either edition. So it's completely up to you if you wanna use the fifth or the sixth. Like most academic textbooks, whenever there is a new edition, there are usually very small, if any, differences between the old and the new edition. And what you'll notice is in the new edition, there are a couple extra notes here and there, but the chapters all line up really well, the material lines up really well between the editions. So I leave it up to you to select either the fifth or the sixth edition. What you will see as you go through the learning activities each week, is that the fifth edition PowerPoint slides are already there. I have then gone and added the sixth edition PowerPoint slides too. So you got both the fifth as well as the sixth edition. You can use whichever one lines up the best for you. If you wanna use both, you can certainly use both because the sixth edition PowerPoint slides tend to be a little bit more detailed and a little bit more comprehensive than what we have with the fifth edition. But they're all up there for your edification. You can use either or you can use both. In addition to the primary textbook, we then also had the classics text. Now this is the same classics text that you use in your 510 course, so you should be familiar with it. We're gonna be pulling from the classics test, text for uh, certain seminal authors, people like you know, Frederick Taylor and Scientific Management here in week one. So there are a lot of articles you've already read in 510. You're gonna just be reviewing them and then applying them within the perspective of personnel and human resource management. Also on the syllabus, we have your course learning objectives that are listed for you. Objective number one, to analyze situations in public personnel management, 
to ensure accountability on the part of personnel leaders. Number two, to practice sound decision-making skills to ensure equity and fairness. Uh, number three, to apply relevant technology skills in order to properly research and formulate grounded basis for efficient and effective practices. And then all these sub-objectives listed for each one of those objectives. So do familiarize yourself with those objectives. Those are the primary things that we are trying to achieve throughout our eight weeks together in the course. The course, you'll also have a variety of different types of assignments. You will have your multimedia discussion board posts. You've probably done these in your previous courses in the MPA program. If you have not, there is a tutorial in week one that you can watch that will familiarize you with how you do these multimedia presentations, how you narrate a PowerPoint presentation, and then how to upload it to YouTube or Vimeo, and then how to embed it then within the discussion board. What I'm hoping that you will do with these multimedia presentations is that you will embed them. So it's not just a link in discussion board, but you'll actually embed the presentation within the discussion board form. But again, I think the vast majority of you have probably already done that before. So we have a series of these multimedia discussion board assignments. The first one here in week one is your introductory assignment. You've probably done these in previous courses as well. So you'll put together a multimedia PowerPoint presentation, a narrated presentation, where you'll introduce yourself to me and to the rest of the class. Uh, again, realizing that a lot of you probably already know each other from previous courses, and many of you already know me from previous courses as well, it's still a good way for you to introduce yourself to all those folks in the course that you don't know yet. Then throughout the course, you'll have a series of these multimedia discussion boards each week on a different topic of interest to public personnel management. So a total of five of those multimedia discussion boards. Then you'll also be doing reflective journal assignments and you've probably become familiar with those in your previous courses as well. You'll have four of those. Then you'll also have four writing assignments. Now, these writing assignments are very brief. We're talking two to three pages on the assigned topic. So you're not writing a dissertation but you're using them to draw on the core human resource concepts, uh, talking about those concepts, um, explaining them, analyzing them, and doing all that, again, within a Christian worldview. All of your written assignments, your uh, journal assignments, should be done in APA. The journal assignments are a little bit looser in that I'm not gonna grade them on APA. Uh, the writing assignments will, though, be graded on APA. So please make sure that you use APA. By now, you're probably familiar with it. I will give you a little hint, and that is that some of your instructors are sticklers on APA. I am not necessarily a stickler on APA. If it looks like APA and feels like APA, it's probably going to be close enough to APA for me. Now, I probably won't be deducting a lot of points for any problems with APA, but I probably will include those in my comments when I return the assignments to you. So I'll make note of any you know, deviations from APA format, but I'm not really going to deduct a whole lot of points for any of those issues. It's more kind of a formative learning type of process. But again, I'm sure all of you have worked with APA before, so uh, you probably know it just about as well as I do. Uh, you'll also be preparing a training video. I think this is a good assignment in this class because it's a good practical hands-on type of assignment. Uh, then you have your critical assignment, the outline of that critical assignment, and then the critical assignment itself. In that critical assignment, you will be uh, developing a human resource plan to try and incorporate the as all the aspects of the course material and the functions of a public service human resource department. The paper will address the key human resource concepts related to recruitment, hiring, job descriptions, employee-friendly policies, assessment, training, and other related topics. So in essence, what you're gonna get with the critical assignment, you'll get a scenario, then your critical paper will then have to respond to that scenario, incorporating all the elements that we have covered in class. So using that, um, course material, using the course textbook, using your additional resources that you're pulling in, 
all to apply that information then directly to address the scenario that you are being presented with. Um, the distribution of points you'll see there on the screen, uh, 25 for your multimedia introductory discussion board posts, uh, 50 points each for your multimedia discussion board posts throughout the course. There are five of them, 50 points each, so a total of 250 points for those. Your four written assignments are 50 points each, so a total of 200 points on your written assignments. 25 for your outline, 50 for each of your reflective journals, and there are four of those, so 200 points total for that. 100 points for the training video that you'll be putting together, and then 200 points for that critical assignment. So when you add it all up, we have a grand total of 1,000 points for the course for the term. You're familiar with the grading scale in terms of the A, A minus, B plus, and so I'll leave that to you to review. And that's essentially the major elements from the syllabus. What I would like to do, though, is to pull out week one and spend a couple of minutes talking about week one and exactly what you can anticipate seeing in week one and the types of assignments that you will be doing. So here in week one, we are going to look at two main topics, public service heritage, kind of talking about where public personnel management came from, distinguishing between personnel management and human resource management, talking about the um, antecedents of our system of civil service that we have in this country, highlighting things like the Pendleton Act and the Civil Service Reform Act and how those created the structure that we currently have now in our system of civil service. Uh, then we'll also talk about the legal rights and responsibilities of a human resource professional in a public organization. So we will talk about anti-discrimination laws, we'll talk about Equal Pay Act, and we'll talk about all those different elements that really guide and dictate how we deal with our employees on a daily basis within our organizations. So as we already said, you have a multimedia introduction discussion board post that you will be doing by week six, and then by, I'm sorry, by day six of this week, by Saturday, and then by day seven on Sunday, you'll then be responding to one of your classmates in terms of their introduction. So your introduction, and then a response to a classmate's introduction. And then you will also have a written assignment. We'll talk about that in just a second. Uh, I do have the PowerPoint slides there for edition number five of the textbook. I then also have chapter one and chapter two PowerPoint slides for the sixth edition. Um, I think it says sixth, but it's really sixth edition of the textbook. So again, you can use either or, or you can use both the fifth and the sixth edition if you would like. Tutorial is there for creating multimedia discussion board uh, assignments, and so you can watch that if you haven't done it before. Short little video, a primer or a reminder probably is more apt on APA format. Then again, for your multimedia introductory post requirement, you'll be developing a PowerPoint presentation. Uh, you'll be narrating that presentation. It should consist of a minimum of three slides. Now, you can certainly go beyond that if you'd like. Presentation should be brief, should be in the range of about two to three minutes. As I said, you'll be narrating that. Then you'll be uploading it probably to YouTube and then embedding the link, embedding it directly into the discussion board forum. So it's not just posting the link, but it's actually embedding the video itself into the discussion board. And if you haven't done it, again, right there, you have the tutorial, the week one multimedia instructions video. Then in addition to that introductory posting in beach board, in, in discussion board, I'm sorry if I slip up and say beach board, it's because I've spent 18 years at Long Beach and because Long Beach thinks it's fancy, it calls it blackboard beach board. So if you hear me say beach board, I mean blackboard, but you'll post that then into blackboard. And then you'll have your written assignment. Now for this written assignment, we are going to be focusing on Paul White's um, four different tides of reform. And in your readings, you'll see the authors present to you Paul White in his four different tides of reform, scientific management, war on waste, waste watchful eye, and liberation management. You'll be selecting one of those four reform movements 
and then writing a very brief two to three page paper where you discuss that concept and its application to public sector human resources. In doing so, what I'm asking you to do is to include an example from your current or past workplace. It's completely up to you. Um, if you are not currently working in the public sector or you don't have a past work experience in the public sector, um, you should select another public organization. Now for this class, we're not going to allow the use of private sector examples. And the reason for that is obviously the management of human resources in public organizations will be much different than the way in which we manage folks in the private sector. So there's not a very strong corollary between the two sectors when it comes to human resource management. Now in another class, like an organization theory class, there's much more of a corollary between some of the theories in the private sector and the public sector. Here, they're so disparate that we're really asking you to focus on a public sector organization. So if you're currently working in a private sector organization, uh, if you have any familiarity or any interest in a public sector organization, we'd really would like for you to use that public sector organization as the basis for this paper. Do remember this is a graduate level paper as all the papers are in this MPA program. So we have certain expectations in terms of the scholarly requirements for those papers. I always say, so I've been teaching MPA programs now for over 20 years. And I always tell my students that an MPA program is both a professional as well as a graduate program. As a professional program, our primary emphasis is placed on the nexus between theory and practicality. So how can we apply these theories in a modern day public organization? So it is very much professional in that regard, but it's also scholarly and graduate in that we have certain scholarly expectations. One of those expectations is that your papers will be well written, that you will proofread them very well, and they will be devoid of typographical and grammatical errors. I will go through your papers, I will edit them. Uh, I'll try not to deduct a whole lot of points for editing issues, but if I do find editing problems, I will certainly use track changes and I will put my edits into the paper and it will have an impact on the grade. So please do be very careful in reading the paper, rereading it, and just make sure that it looks like a final draft as opposed to a first draft. Make sure everything hangs together well, make sure that the examples you're using, your supporting evidence really does support your, your thesis statement within the paper, and just make sure it's well written, it flows well, everything hangs together very well. The grading on that paper will be 40% on accuracy, on theory accuracy, 40% on theory application, 10% on thesis development, and 10% on writing style, formatting, spelling, and grammar. So that's gonna be your first writing assignment. Again, selecting one of those four of Paul White's eras of reform and discussing that and showing me examples of how you see that era of reform incorporated or exhibited within the organization that you are focusing on. So for this week, you basically have those two main assignments, your multimedia introductory post and then your uh, written assignment. So that's what we're gonna be doing for this week. So I just thought I'd introduce you to that so uh, there are no questions later on. If you do have some questions about the assignments, as always, feel free to um, shoot me an email and I'm more than happy to, uh, to respond to you. So let me go ahead and share out, if I can find it, our our lecture there we go okay i think we got it up there now so let me 
Okay, there we go. I think it's up there. You should be able to see it. Uh, the PowerPoint slides just for our week one lecture. And what I like to do is each week I will do this where I will share with you usually a relatively brief video, just kind of welcome you to the week, go back over and some of the important information and concepts from the previous week, and then introduce some of the main concepts for the upcoming week. So what I'd like to do now is just kind of introduce you to some of the main concepts that we're going to be reading about and discussing here in week one of the course. So one of the main things that we're going to talk about is we're going to talk about this difference between public personnel management and human resource management. Now, as you all know, the title of the course is obviously public personnel management. But a lot of the things we're going to talk about, a lot of the things we will focus on will be more along the lines of human resource management. So what's the difference between the two? Well, in traditional personnel management, we are focused more on rules and procedures, processes of the civil service system. So in public personnel management, we talk about the different techniques that we use to recruit employees to do job classification and reclassification, how we assign compensation, uh, different strategies for disciplining and sanctioning employees, for evaluating their performance. So we really kind of get into the rules and the processes and the procedures. By contrast, a focus on human resource management will be much more people focused. We'll look more at things like motivation. We look more at the relationship between the individual and the organization. How does the organization affect the individual? How does the individual affect the organization? So for instance, human resource management theory, people like Douglas McGregor. Douglas McGregor talks a lot about what it means for a theory Y employee to be working in a theory X organization and what detrimental impacts would a classical Theory X organization have on the motivational levels of a Theory Y employee? And that type of disconnect between the way the organization is structured and operates and the wants, needs, and desires of individual employees. So how the individual and the organization work together, hopefully in this symbiotic relationship? We look at how we develop individual employees as human resources. We look at how we develop the organization and what's called OD, organizational development, um, how we design the organization, you know, how we uh, implement culture in the organization, the impact that then has on our employees, um, the types of rewards that we provide our employees, intrinsic versus extrinsic rewards. So it's a much more people focused approach. Whereas traditional public personnel management is much more of a rules procedural type of an approach. Now we will combine both of those in this class. So while we will have a focus on human resource management, we will also be sure to highlight the rules and the processes that then provide the structure and the parameters within which these relationships between people will exist. So we kind of combine both worlds together in a class like this. So even though the class is called public personnel management, there is a very big human resource management component to the material we cover in the class. Most, if not all organizations will have some type of a human resource department, an HR department. But the way in which HR departments look and where they are located may differ between organizations. Now, traditionally, what we oftentimes see in an organization is a centralized HR department. In a centralized HR department, we are staffing that HR office with professionals. And those professionals are then experts on the managing of human resources. So most of the functions of human resource management will be centralized within that centralized HR department. One of the advantages of having a centralized HR department is in terms of risk management. There are a lot of risks that can occur when you are managing employees. You may violate civil service protections. 
You may violate constitutional protections. You may violate the collective bargaining agreement. There are a lot of different ways in which we can commit errors when we are managing our personnel. So by centralizing all those function functions in this centralized HR department, you will have all those functions done by experts. And so you will then minimize your potential risk exposure when it comes to legal action. So there is something to certainly recommend a centralized HR department. Now, the problem with the centralized HR department is that you are taking the decision-making authority away from line managers. And you're taking that decision authority away from where the decisions need to be made. One of the maxims in public organization theory is that you try and co-locate decision-making authority with where the decisions occur. The more distance you have between where the decisions are made and the authority for making those decisions, the more difficult it is to operate in an efficient and effective manner. So when you're centralizing your HR department, you are locating the decision-making authority far away from where the decisions are being made. So another model is to devolve HR functions. Where you will have a central HR office that will do mostly policy work, but the functional responsibilities are done by line managers and operational units. So the functional decisions and the functional decision-making authority will then reside at those lower levels of the organization where the decisions are being made. It's called a devolved HR model. In a decentralized HR model, you again still have your centralized HR department, but it's much smaller, it has fewer functions, it becomes much more policy oriented and that's focused at the overarching policies that affect the entire organization. But where the rubber meets the road in terms of those actual functional decisions, those decisions tend to be made by smaller HR units that are located throughout the organization. So again, more functional decisions being made outside of the centralized HR office still being done by folks who have HR experience, but not being centralized in that one office. Specialized HR departments, you've got a core HR department, but then you also have specialized uh, HR units for hiring, promotions, and things such as that in different parts of the organization. And so I think as the example shows you on the screen, universities really serve as a good example. So in a university, you're going to have HR function being done for staff members, HR functions being done for faculty members, and oftentimes those are done in different departments. So for faculty members, their HR decisions will be made in an Office of Faculty Affairs. For staff members, it will be done in a benefits or an HR office. And so you have different offices doing these functions, for different employees, so specialized types of departments. And then the other option, obviously, is privatization, where you outsource some of your HR functions to private organizations, to consultants. Uh, in my school district, I mentioned in my introduction that I'm a school board member. In my district right now, we are talking about outsourcing some of our HR functions primarily a function such as uh, the job analysis and job evaluation function. So we will see this as we go through this class, but two of the major things that we do from an HR perspective is we conduct what are called job analyses, and then we also conduct job evaluations. Now, the job analysis, what you do is you look at each of your individual positions, and you deconstruct each of those positions into its component elements in order to find out what's actually being done on a daily basis in those positions. So a job analysis is when you look at each one of your different positions in isolation to see what's going on on a daily basis. So typically what you will do and the way you'll do a job analysis, if you haven't done one before or been subject to one, is that you will have someone shadow the incumbent in the position. So they will come in, they will ask that incumbent, well, how much time do you spend doing this? How much time do you spend doing this type of function? And they will then watch the employee do their job, and they will actually find out exactly 
what percentage of the job is spent on correspondence? What percentage of the job is spent on, um, you know, interacting with clients or whatever the case may be? And so they'll do that for each individual job. Then there's what's called job evaluation. Job evaluation is where you take the results of each one of those job analyses and you then compare jobs to each other for the purpose of then creating a classification system and then assigning compensation. So let's say you're in a police department. You conduct a job analysis for the police chief position, then a job analysis for a police lieutenant position, a job analysis for a patrol officer position. And you see what goes on on a daily basis in each one of those positions. Then in your job evaluation, you will compare them to each other. And so what you might find out is that in terms of responsibility, the police chief job is much more of a responsible job than a police lieutenant, and the police lieutenant job is much more responsible than the patrol officer. However, in terms of risk of harm, the patrol officer job is probably going to rank the highest on risk of harm, followed by the lieutenant job, followed by the police chief job. So you can then compare those jobs and then make the decision, well, what's most important? Uh, is responsibility, level of responsibility, more important than risk of harm? If so, you will then weight the um, responsibility component stronger than you would the uh, risk of harm. So maybe. 40% of compensation should be for responsibility, 20% of compensation should be based upon risk of harm. And then what that allows you to do in that job evaluation, oftentimes what's called a point factor job evaluation, is assign points to each of those elements of the job, add it all up, and then the jobs that have a higher point total, that score higher, are then placed at a higher classification level than the other jobs. And then those jobs there at the higher classification level will then receive more compensation than those at a lower classification level. And I know this is kind of an extended discussion, but just to illustrate that in my district, we are outsourcing that. And so we are talking about bringing in a private uh, company, a consultant, to come in and do the job analysis and do the job evaluation to help us reclassify our positions for compensation purposes. Uh, and so once you outsource that, hopefully you'll save money, you'll free up some of the time that otherwise would be spent by your in-house employees doing these types of jobs. But the downside is obviously a lack of control. That if you're no longer, your employees are no longer the ones doing the job analysis and job evaluation being done by someone outside your organization, you want to make sure you have some type of a quality control mechanism to make sure they're doing the job appropriately. So how we structure our HR departments and where we locate those HR decisions can vary depending upon organization. Again, when you centralize these functions, you oftentimes are doing it for the purpose of risk mitigation so that you can reduce the legal exposure that you may have if something goes wrong or one of those HR managers creates an error because those folks in that centralized office, those are the ones who have the expertise and the training to be able to do these types of functions. Um, one of the main assignments this week, as I had said before, is this written assignment. And this written assignment, you will review Paul White's four different quote unquote tides of reform and select one of those tides of reform and talk about it in terms of how it has changed public employment and what examples you see of that reform within the organization that you have selected. So one of the things you'll read about this week is how Paul White presents to us these four different categories of reform or tides of reform scientific management, the war on waste, the watchful eye, and the fourth one, liberation management. Now, scientific management is something that you are probably familiar with. You have covered it in your 510 class. If you took organization theory, you covered it in organization theory as well. So you should be relatively familiar with Frederick Taylor and his theory of scientific management. Emerging primarily in the early 1900s and really taking hold in the 1920s, 
scientific management really focused on the process of how jobs were being done. So it focused on job specialization, task, task specialization, having a chain of command in the organization, a tall hierarchy, establishing rules and procedures and processes, teaching people those rules and procedures, and then evaluating them based upon how well they are following those procedures in doing their individual jobs. So we really did emphasize a lot of conformity that people doing the same job should be doing it in essentially the same way. It also provided a lot of predictability because you knew exactly how people should be doing their jobs. It was a very top-down, very controlling type of an approach to how we manage our individual employees. As you know from your 510 class, Frederick Taylor and his theory of scientific management, his time motion studies, fit very clearly within the classical school of how we manage our organizations, how we manage our personnel. Now, this classical approach to having very close top-down supervision of our employees and deconstructing the job into its the most effective ways of doing the job than teaching people how to do those functions in the most effective and efficient way than evaluating them on how well they are doing those functions. That type of scientific management approach tends to be rather depersonalizing, dehumanizing to employees. When you read through Frederick Taylor, you will find in some of his work, he actually refers to employees as being boorish beasts. They are cogs in the machinery of the organization. So just like a cog in a machine, if a tooth breaks off a cog, you throw it away, you replace it with a new one, the machine cranks up and the machine moves on. So people are replaceable, they didn't have a whole lot of inherent value. We still see a lot of that scientific management in our modern day public agencies. The problem is that it is so dehumanizing and is so procedurally driven that it oftentimes serves as the antithesis of the performance focus that we oftentimes like to see in our organizations where we're trying to develop people's resources, their ability to become better performers, not just because of how well they can do the job, but also because of how it benefits that individual. That there is some value placed upon developing an individual as a resource beyond just what that individual can do for the organization. That's kind of where we are today in our public agencies. And scientific management is sometimes the complete antithesis of that. But despite that, we see a lot of examples of scientific management in our organizations. We see a lot of policy and procedure manuals. We see classification systems. All those job analysis, all those things are all artifacts of Frederick Taylor and this first title reform known as scientific management. Then the second title reform that Light presents to us is this war on waste. Again, a focus on efficiency trying to make sure that we are spending the money as efficiently as possible and that we are eliminating wasteful spending through things like audits, internal and external audit controls, investigations on how we are spending our money, really resulted in a proliferation of very detailed rules, processes, and procedures in our public agencies. But the primary focus in the war on waste type of reform it's to make sure that money is not being wasted on things it should not be spent on and to make sure that we are spending money in the legally appropriated way as effectively as we can spend that money. And so again, primary vehicle there, the use of audits, financial audits, as well as management-based audits. Then the third reform tide that Light presents to us is what he calls this watchful eye. So we really focus on fairness and openness of the public sector. We protect whistleblowers because whistleblowers are the ones who will be keeping this watchful eye on their organizations. So we have things like the Whistleblowers Protection Act that we end up getting that provide certain protections from retribution for those who blow the whistle on any type of um, illegal spending or any type of illegal 
uh, or inefficient types of activities within our organization. Um, minimizes the use of illegitimate hiring criteria such as gender and race and age and status of disability. Um, to minimize those arbitrary decisions when we discipline and sanction and fire our employees. So it's kind of this over oversight type of function that the media and interest groups and whistleblowers can have over public agencies. And then your fourth is what's called liberation management. And this is what we see and hope to see more and more today, more of a focus on enhancing performance in government, looking at the outcomes of what we are doing. So not just looking at the output of what we are creating on a daily basis, but rather looking at the consequences of that output and what those outputs then mean for the beneficiaries, the citizens, the clients who will be consuming those outputs. So an output is just the product that you are creating. The outcome is the consequence, the impact that it is having. So we started asking the question of, so what? My favorite question in all my classes is, so what? That's what we're asking here. Well, so what? So you are creating these products, you're creating these services, these goods on a daily basis. Well, so what? What impact are these services and the products and goods having on society, having on our consumers? So it's much more of a shift toward performance as defined by the outcomes that are being created by the outputs that are produced by the organization. So much more of a customer service, much more of a focus on continuous improvement, uh, work teams, employee empowerment, self-directed, self-governed employees, flattened hierarchies, getting rid of the old top-down classical bureaucratic machine that we saw with Max Weber and Frederick Taylor and many of the classical theorists. We're replacing it with a flatter, uh, more democratic, if you will, type of structure in which our employees get to work. Looking at organizational development through a harmonious relationship between employees, management, and the organization. So life presents to us those as four of the main tides of reform, as he calls them, for your written assignment, you'll be selecting again one of those four and then elaborating upon it and how you see it implemented and exhibited within your given public organization. Our system of personnel management is also predicated upon the advent of the civil service system. Now, as you know, probably from your 510 class and perhaps other classes that you have had, we have gone through several different eras in government employment. In the very early days of the nation, in the late 1700s, early 1800s, we were in what was called the era of gentlemen. We were in an era where we hired people to work in the federal bureaucracy based upon who they were, based upon their status in society. So we were hiring those folks who came from the quote unquote, best educational background, from the upper strata of society, these quote unquote gentlemen, those were the people who were being hired to work in government. The reason for that was a relatively simple one, legitimacy. In the late 1700s, unlike today, you wouldn't necessarily go to bed and expect the next morning to wake up and the government will be there. It was kind of hit or miss whether or not the government would exist from one day to the next. Today, you go to bed and you know you get up the next morning, probably the national government and state government, and local government is probably still going to be there. But it wasn't that case in the late 1700s. So it added some legitimacy and so built some trust, if you will, between citizens and this fledgling new government. Then, as you know, probably from your history classes or maybe from 510, uh, we then had this corrupt bargain in 1824. And the election of 1824, we had multiple candidates running. And we had John Quincy Adams running, we had um, Andrew Jackson running, and we had people like Henry Clay and others running. 
But because we had so many different candidates running, there was a split in the Electoral College vote. Andrew Jackson won most of the popular votes. Andrew Jackson then also won more Electoral College votes than anyone else who was running. So you would think, since he won more Electoral votes than anyone else, according to the Constitution, he would then become president. But as you also know in the Constitution, if no one wins a majority in the Electoral College, the election then goes to the House of Representatives. The House of Representatives then picks the president, and the Senate then picks the vice president. So since no one had a majority in Electoral College, the election was thrown into the House of Representatives. When it was thrown into the House of Representatives, the corrupt bargain that's referred to is when the supporters of Adams then joined forces with the supporters of Henry Clay, and the deal that was made was that if Henry Clay would then, and his supporters would then throw their support behind Adams, then Adams would then appoint Henry Clay to a cabinet position, to Secretary of State. So Henry Clay's advocates in Congress then threw their support behind Adams, that then gave Adams the uh, votes he needed in Congress to then become president, even though he did not win more electoral votes than Andrew Jackson. So Adams then becomes president. There's obviously a major hue and cry about this corrupt bargain. Four years later in 1828, along comes Andrew Jackson again. Andrew Jackson wins a resounding victory in both the popular vote as well as the electoral vote and comes into the White House in 1828 and ushers in with him a new approach to hiring in government. So rather than hiring based upon who the person was, when Andrew Jackson came in, he brought patronage with him. He brought in what was called the era of spoils. So instead of getting your job in government based upon who you were, you got your job in government based upon who you knew. Did you support the winning political party? Did you support the winning candidate? So to the winner go the spoils. So whenever a candidate would win from a party, that party then had the ability to appoint its followers to positions in government. So from 1828 up until the 1880s, we essentially had this era of spoils or era of patronage, where you got your job in government based upon whether or not you supported the winning candidate and the winning political party. Our modern day system of civil service though, really got its start in the 1880s with this act known as the Pendleton Act. So there had been an undercurrent for many, many years, especially at the local level, to change the era of spoils and change the way in which we were selecting people to work in government. Because when you are selecting people based upon their ability to help a candidate get elected, the skills it takes to help someone get elected to office are not the same skills it takes to properly and effectively govern. And we learned that throughout the 1860s and the 1870s, where there was a lot of inefficiency, there was a lot of corruption, there was a lot of abuse. We had our major cities being run by political machines, the most famous one, Tammany Hall in New York City, where jobs and contracts were just basically rewards to be given to people and to groups who supported you in your election. We had a very important focusing or triggering event that occurred with the assassination of President Garfield. So President Garfield was assassinated in 1881 by a man named Charles J. Guiteau. Now, Charles J. Guiteau is a very interesting individual. He had written some political speeches for President Garfield and when Garfield ran in 1880, there's absolutely no evidence whatsoever that President Garfield ever read or used any of those speeches, even less evidence that he even knew who Charles J. Guiteau was. But Guiteau surmised that this is the era of spoils. So I wrote these speeches, I helped Garfield win the presidency, so therefore Garfield owes me and Garfield owes me a prominent position in his government. And Charles Giguito, who was never very shy about his aspirations, wanted to be Secretary of State. 
Well, clearly Garfield did not appoint him as Secretary of State. So being the very irrational person he was, Charles J. Guiteau thought, well, if I assassinate Garfield, Garfield's vice president, Chester Arthur, is a big believer in the spoil system. So if I assassinate Garfield, Chester Arthur will become president, and then Chester Arthur will reward me for getting him promoted, if you will, to president. So Guiteau assassinates Garfield. It's a triggering event because people were mortified by what happened. People thought, well, you know, we really do need to change the way in which we are giving out these jobs because look what happened to President Garfield. Not to oversimplify it, but it really was in public policy what we call a triggering or a focusing event. Member of Congress by a last name Pendleton for many years had been carrying around in his suit pocket this legislation that would come to be known as the Pendleton Act to replace the era of spoils, and the era of patronage, with a civil service system. So in 1883, as a result of the assassination of Garfield, he was able to get it passed through Congress, signed by the president into law as the Pendleton Act. It introduces a merit system into the federal government so that you got your job based upon what you knew as opposed to who you knew. So in the era of gentlemen, you got your job based upon who you were. Era of spoils, you got it based upon who you knew. In the era of merit with the penalty act, you get it based upon what you know. So we introduced this new thing called a civil service commission that was meant to be a buffer against spoils, to be a buffer against partisan pressure so that we can hire people based upon their expertise and then they keep their job based upon their performance as opposed to keeping it based upon their partisan predilections. So you've got this civil service commission that's established to protect this merit principle. You introduce things like examinations, competitive examinations, where people would take these examinations and then those who scored the best on those exams would then end up getting a job in the federal government. You allowed people to enter into this new civil service system at any level. So that you could come in at a middle manager level, an upper level management level, straight in from the private sector. Now in your 510 class, you probably read Woodrow Wilson. Woodrow Wilson's study of administration is the classical start of the discipline of public administration. We're looking at one piece of writing that really started the discipline of public administration. As you know, we go back to Wilson's article uh, back in the 1880s. Wilson, when he wrote that article, talked about how we took a merit-based system from England and applied it to our US system. We did not create civil service. We did not create merit-based hiring. That had been created by others years and decades earlier. What we did is we borrowed it from England and we applied it to our system. We applied it to our unique political culture. And in applying it to our unique political culture, the way in which we did it is we had to modify some of these things from the British system of civil service. So for instance, examinations. We did not create examinations. That system came from Britain. But the way in which examinations were used in Britain is that they were used in a very closed type of system where not everyone could take these job exams. Only certain people qualified to take the examinations. When we brought exams into the US, we had to make them open exams to better fit our more open political culture in America. So we have these open examinations. In England, in their civil service system, if you wanted to go and get a job in government, you had to start at the bottom of the hierarchy. You had to start at the lowest level and you work your way up. Irrespective of whatever position you may have had in the business sector, you had to start at the bottom. Again, because we had a more open political culture, we now allow for lateral entry into the civil service as opposed to what was going on in Britain. The important part of this that a lot of people overlook with Wilson's article. The people read Wilson's article and they say, well, politics, administration, dichotomy. True. The, he did lay out for us this politics, administration, dichotomy. 
But one line in the Wilson article that's oftentimes overlooked is where Wilson says that politics are the touchstone of administration. And what he means by that is that whatever administrative system we put in place to manage our employees and hire our employees, it must be congruent with the unique political culture in that nation. We used our unique political culture as the touchstone for civil service system through the Pendleton Act by having open examinations, by having lateral entry into the civil service, all of those things were modified based upon our unique political culture. But thanks to the Pendleton Act in 1883, we now have merit-based hiring. We are now in this era of merit. Now, as you know, not every employee in the federal government is a merit-based employee. What we have in our agencies is the vast majority of people who work in those agencies and departments are civil service employees. They are hired based upon merit principles. However, the individuals at the very top echelon of those agencies and departments are political appointees. They are appointed by the president and they are confirmed by the US Senate. So they are politically appointed people. So essentially what you have in our system of federal employment is you have a hybrid system whereby you have your political appointees, uh, era of patronage basically at the very top of the organization, and then the vast majority of the rest of the organization are merit-based civil service employees. Now what happened since 1883 is that for the next 100 years, that's kind of the system that we operated within. The problem though is that over that almost 100 year period of time, we developed a lot of confusion about exactly what civil service protections were and exactly who was supposed to enforce those civil service protections. And we had small laws overlaid upon small laws year after year that created a very convoluted and very complex system. So when Jimmy Carter becomes president in 1978, we end up getting a major overhaul to our civil service system known as the Civil Service Reform Act. The Civil Service Reform Act did a lot of things that we'll talk about on the next screen. But the Civil Service Reform Act essentially combined those four different tides of reform that Light talks about, kind of combined them all together into the main areas of focus. So it created this thing called a Senior Executive Service. That Senior Executive Service was meant to try and organize the presidential chain of command to kind of provide a conduit, if you will, between the political appointees at the top of the organization and the vast majority of employees who are merit-based civil service employees. So these senior executive service members were kind of placed in between the political appointees at the top and everybody else in the civil service. The idea, again, was to create a conduit because what had been happening is that the president was able to place his or her people in as political appointees and then direct those political appointees to do certain things with the agency. Well, if you're a career civil servant working in an agency, a new political appointee comes in and tells you to do something, you will just wait them out. You'll say, well, that person is here for a maximum of four years, probably more likely here for 18 to 24 months. I'm here for 30 to 40 years. I'm a career employee. I'll just wait until they're gone and until a new political appointee comes in who is more in line with what I want to see done in the organization. So that type of disconnect between political appointees and career civil servants made it very difficult for presidents to manage these organizations. Take, for instance, um, Ronald Reagan. You know, Ronald Reagan wanted to eliminate the Department of Education. He placed someone in charge of the Department of Education, a secretary who he thought would take apart the Department of Education. Well, it never happened. And in fact, the Department of Education actually grew in the Reagan administration as opposed to going out of existence because it was very difficult as a political appointee to come in and basically steer the ship in a different direction when everyone else is rowing 
differently than you are. And so the idea was this senior executive service would help the president better manage these organizations and kind of bridge that gap, if you will, in this presidential chain of command. So kind of a scientific management type of approach. Place a cap on total federal employment to save money. That's your war on waste approach. Provided whistleblower protections to those who are blowing whistle, blowing the whistle on inefficient or illegal types of activities. That's your watchful eye approach. And then introduce pay for performance in terms of bonus pay for senior executive service members, merit pay for all those below the senior executive service in the um, what we call the GS 16 to GS, I'm sorry, GS 13 to GS 15 levels to give them pay for performance. Again, to try and, and increase performance levels, liberation management. So you basically have four of, all four of those reforms all embedded within this Civil Service Reform Act. So the Civil Service Reform Act did a lot of things. It created what was called OPM, the Office of Personnel Management. OPM was charged with coordinating pretty much every personnel function within the federal government. When it comes to advertising positions, when it comes to administering examinations, selecting individuals, allocating work, all of that fell within the umbrella of this one organization known as the Office of Personnel Management. Office of Personnel Management is still with us today at the federal level. Then it created this thing called the Merit Systems Protection Board. The purpose of the Merit Systems Protection Board was if an individual member of the civil service felt that they were having their merit principles violated. So they were being disciplined or they were being terminated because they were supporting a different political party or something like that. That was a violation of merit principles. That person could then take a case to the Merit Systems Protection Board. If you wanted to blow the whistle, you saw that something was violating someone else's merit principles, so not violating yours, but you saw someone else having their merit principles being violated. If you reported that, you're then referred to as a whistleblower. Well, it also, also then created this thing called the Office of Special Counsel, or the OSC, within the Merit Systems Protection Board. The job of the OSC was to hear these whistleblower claims and to then adjudicate the whistleblower claims, making sure that there was no retribution for those whistleblowers. Then you had this thing called the FLRA, the Federal Labor Relations Authority. The Federal Labor Relations Authority was supposed to oversee and investigate labor management relations. So whenever an employee bargaining unit would then negotiate with management to try and come to an agreement, a collective bargaining agreement, that negotiation process was overseen by the Federal Labor Relations Authority. Essentially, the Federal Labor Relations Authority did the same thing for public sector agencies that the National Labor Relations Board did for private sector agencies. So it was analogous to this National Labor Relations Board only for public sector organizations. So all public sector organizations, for the most part, their negotiations fall within the oversight of the Federal Labor Relations Authority, with the exception of the U.S. Postal Service. U.S. Postal Service, their negotiations are under the National Labor Relations Board because they are a government corporation. And then you have this, what I mentioned for senior executive service, to be this conduit between political appointees and career civil servants. So what we did is we had this classification system at the federal level that ran from a GS-1 position, General Schedule 1, up to a GS-18, General Schedule 18. What we did in the Civil Service Reform Act is we took the top three levels, the GS-16, 17, and 18 employees, and we put them into this new thing called the Senior Executive Service. We then offered those individuals in the Senior Executive Service bonus pay. So if their agencies or departments perform better in a given fiscal year, they would then be eligible for bonus pay. Problem with that is that Congress never made good on that bonus pay. Congress promised bonus pay, never followed through on it. 
So when you look at this Civil Service Reform Act, the truth of the matter is that a lot of the things created under the Civil Service Reform Act had problems, didn't work quite as well as we hoped they would work. OPM, we ask it to do too much. So now what we have done is we have decentralized hiring. So OPM no longer uh, creates their list of three or five top scoring candidates and provides to agencies. Now agencies have a lot more flexibility in terms of how they hire their employees because we are just asking OPM to do too much across the whole federal government. So OPM is still there. It just doesn't have the same range of functions it used to back in 1978. Merit Systems Protection Board is still there but it doesn't quite have the same trust that it did back when it was created in 1978. There are a series of examples of when people went to the Merit Systems Protection Board to complain that their merit protections are being violated and Merit Systems Protection Board then found in favor of the agency. Another problem with the Civil Service Reform Act is when it created the Merit Systems Protection Board, remember it put this Office of Special Counsel for whistleblowers within the Merit Systems Protection Board. The problem there is that we ended up having a backlog of cases where literally people could blow the whistle and go to the Office of Special Counsel and end up in a backlog of cases two to three years long. So they were out of the agency and gone to the private sector before the case would ever get resolved. So subsequent to, do, to that in 1991, we pulled the Office of Special Counsel out of the Merit Systems Protection Board, made it its own organization, gave it its own staff, its own resources, reduced some of that backlog. So it's a little bit more effective today than it's been in the past. Federal Labor Relations Authority some high profile instances where again, the Federal Labor Relations Authority sided with management over public employee units. The most obvious example of that was the air traffic controller strike. The very early part of the Reagan administration, air traffic controllers went on strike. They weren't able to come to an agreement in negotiations, they went on strike. The Reagan administration warned them that if you go on strike, we will fire you because this is a public safety issue. So those air traffic controllers who chose to go on strike were immediately fired by the Reagan administration. And they then hired new air traffic controllers, trained them very quickly to then go and take those positions. Air traffic controllers then said that's an unfair labor practice, took their case to the Federal Labor Relations Authority, Federal Labor Relations Authority ruled in favor of the Reagan administration, saying that this is a public safety type of issue. So therefore, the safety of the nation could not stand having all these air traffic controllers off the job. Now, whether you agree with that decision or not, what ended up happening is that a lot of federal unions looked at that and said, well, we're not going to get the protections that we thought we were get from the Federal Labor Relations Authority. Again, either making that determination fairly or unfairly, that's a determination that they made. So there was kind of a erosion of trust between unions and the Federal Labor Relations Authority. But the FLRA is still around and operational today. And then the Senior Executive Service, as we mentioned before, Congress promised bonus pay, never made good on those promises, led to a lot of dissatisfaction, a lot of resentment on the part of Senior Executive Service members. Uh, if you ask, senior executive service members, whether or not they would join the senior executive service again, many of them will say no. And recent surveys have shown that over 70% of members of the senior executive service would not recommend it to younger employees. Now, again, a lot of problems with these different things that were created by the Civil Service Reform Act, but the truth of the matter is they're all still with us today and the modern civil service system that we have today really is very similar to what was created back in 1978 in the Civil Service Reform Act. 1990s, we had the reinvention of government movement that again had profound impacts upon how we hire and manage people in the federal government. Coming out of a book by Osborne and Gabler, Osborne and Gabler argued that we needed to focus on consumers. We needed to focus on the results of what government was producing 
rather than the actual production itself. So it created this reform known as the National Performance Review, the NPR, that Vice President at the time, Al Gore, was in charge of. And the idea was to reduce the size of the federal government, to make it work better, and to cost less, and to produce better outcomes and results for Americans. So we reduced the number of federal employees by over 300,000 positions. Admittedly, a lot of those were in the military and the Department of Defense, but still a huge reduction to the federal workforce and really focused our attention on the consequences of what we were doing for citizens. And asking the question, are we producing the products and are we producing the services that are needed by citizens? So it really shifted the focus to the outcomes as opposed to just the process or the outputs. Again, a really good example of the liberation management tide of reform there in the 1990s in the Clinton Gore administration. Now, we also know that when we manage personnel and human resources, we are doing it within a series of different laws, rules, and organizations. One of the more important organizations that we deal with, the EEOC, the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission. Working in conjunction with the Department of Labor responsible for most federal employment laws, enforce and administer the law, provide guidance in terms of making sure that equal access is being provided to employment in the federal government. So we have accountability to the EEOC, we have accountability to EEOC regulations, EEOC policy statements. Um, perhaps not always binding in court, but certainly give them a lot of deference by the courts today. Civil Rights Act of 1886, major anti-discrimination employment statute you'll read about in your textbook, prohibits intentional employment discrimination based on race and ethnicity. The ADA, Americans with Disabilities Act, prohibits employment discrimination against qualified individuals with disabilities. Equal Pay Act, making it illegal to pay men and women different wage rates for equal work on jobs that require equal skill, effort, and responsibility. Typically, the public sector does much better in terms of equal pay than what we tend to see in the private sector. OSHA, Occupational Safety and Health Act, regulating safety and health conditions for employees, uh, exposure to health hazards, uh, making sure that you know, chairs and desks and office equipment are ergonomically correct, um, all these types of OSHA requirements. Uh, agencies are held responsible for in terms of meeting the needs of their personnel and their employees. Now, most employees in the federal government and in the public sector at the state and local level tend to be civil service employees. And one of the major reasons why we ask you to use a public organization for your paper as opposed to a private sector organization is this difference between civil service employment and at will employment. Most government employees are civil service employees, which means they get their job based upon merit, based upon qualifications, and they keep their jobs based upon those qualifications. In the private sector, most employees are at-will employees. It means it's much easier to dismiss that employee. You don't have the same documentation requirements in the private sector for disciplining an employee as you do in the public sector with a civil service type of employee. So civil service and at will, big difference between the public versus the private sector. And for any of you who have ever done any hiring in the public sector, you know just how long it takes to hire individuals into public organizations. Sometimes it will take a series of months, sometimes up to four, five, six months before you can hire someone to work in a public agency, whereas hiring an at will employee in the private sector it can be done immediately and the person could start the next day. So major differences in terms of how we hire people, how we treat people, how we discipline people, and eventually how we terminate people. Now, some folks have the misconception that you cannot terminate a civil service employee. That is not true. And you'll see that as we go through the material in the class. You can terminate a public employee. But what you'll need to do is document 
So you'll need to document the subpar performance, then offer training opportunities for the employee, then evaluate again, and again, document that subpar performance, then provide additional training opportunities, then evaluate the employee again. It's going to take a series of documented instances to show that there is a pattern of subpar performance and that that subpar performance has tried to be mitigated. You tried to mitigate it with training and development. So you need that type of documentation. Typically, if you have a unionized, um, unionized employees, those evaluation and training and discipline standards and procedures will probably be spelled out in the collective bargaining agreement. And that's what makes human resource management so difficult in the public sector. We have a lot of moving parts we need to deal with. We not only need to make sure we are protecting civil service types of requirements and giving them their civil service protections, but we also have to make sure that we are not running afoul of the collective bargaining agreement. So the contract oftentimes is as important as those civil service protections that employees have. Now, as a civil service employee, you receive these protections from partisan influence. And so in 1939, at the federal level, we had this Hatch Act. The Hatch Act basically said, you are protected from partisan retribution, if you will. You're protected from being dismissed for political purposes. However, we are going to ask something from you in return. And what we are going to ask from you is that you do not engage in political activity using government resources and using your government position on government time. So you certainly do not give up your First Amendment protections when you become a public employee. But you do have certain limitations placed upon the political activities you can engage in using your office, using public resources, using public time. So it's kind of this quid pro quo. We will protect you from political interference, but you must refrain from certain types of political activities as a public employee in a public office during public time. So the federal law was called the Hatch Act. That Hatch Act then created these, these two different categories, or the Office of Special Counsel created these two different categories of employees. So you have further restricted employees who work in intelligence enforcement types of agencies. They have very, very little ability to participate in partisan politics. Less restricted employees, so these outside of intelligence and enforcement types agencies, they are still limited in terms of the political activities they can engage in but they have fewer limitations than what you tend to see with further restricted employees. Um, some of the controversy that you've seen playing out in the news over the past couple of years in terms of the FBI and some alleged um, partisan behaviors going on in the FBI, um, that's become so contentious because those individuals are in the further restricted category, thus having even more restrictions placed upon them in terms of the political activities they can engage in. So at the federal level, we have the Hatch Act. Each date subsequent to the Federal Hatch Act has passed its own what we call Little Hatch Act. And so you know, here in California, we have a Political Resp uh, Responsibility Act, the PRA. And so here in California, we have further limitations that are placed upon public employees in terms of the types of partisan activities they can engage in as a public employee on public time using public resources. What we pay our employees also is something that is subject to federal laws. So back in 1938, we had the Fair Labor Standards Act that mandated a minimum wage to be paid and requires that overtime be paid at time and a half of the regular rate for hours that go beyond 40 hours per week. Now, we do exempt some, some employees based upon their uh, executive administrative professional capacity. But again, what we were doing with the Fair Labor Standards Act is we were placing some minimum wage requirements. So I mentioned before Equal Pay Act. We'll talk more about that. Workers' compensation, we'll talk more about that as well. 
Uh, family and medical leave, you're probably familiar with the more recent act. Again, a limitation upon how we deal with our employees. And I'll wrap this up. I know I've been going on very long, but anti-discrimination laws. We'll cover those as well. Civil Rights Act, Age Discrimination Act, ADA, Equal Employment Opportunity, and Affirmative Action. So I'm sorry I've gone on so long, but there's just so much information here in week one. Please make sure to do the readings. If you have any questions at all, please let me know. I look forward to reading your discussion board posts as well as your written assignment. Shoot me an email if you have any questions. Otherwise, I hope this has been a relatively brief uh, introduction to the material for you. I look forward to working with everyone. I um, wish everyone a great week and please let me know if you have any questions and we will talk again soon. I'll have another video that I'll put up for week number two. So thanks a lot and have a great week.